Good morning, everybody. Thank you for attending. Uh, this is, uh, was a, is a 45 minute talk, so I've done my best to try to cool it a little bit and squish it down, and I'll try to move along here. I have a, a non live demo, but it's a very great demo because I know it'll work. And uh, because of the constraints of time, I'll try to uh, field questions during that demo as well as narrate what's going on during that demo. So, he mentioned he didn't know what that necessarily was. What it is, uh, we'll talk about, and I'll explain why we took upon this project at HP. I'm, I'm Patrick Galbraith, and I work for HP's Advanced Technology Group within HP Cloud. Uh, our mission in life is to basically look for new technologies, look for new trends, and find things that are exciting, and try to um, make recommendations, and tell people directions that they might want to pursue. Uh, my background is I was a Perl guy. I worked at Slashdot for three years. I worked at uh, Classmates for a little while. I worked at MySQL for three years, wrote the Federated Storage Engine and a couple other things. Still the Perl maintainer for the Perl driver. I, uh, though my day job now, I would say I mostly write uh, some Python, maybe some Go, uh, Ansible playbooks. Whatever needs to get done. I've done, I've been a DBA, I've been a DevOps guy, I've been whatever needs to happen, developer. Uh, right now, more of a researcher and a lot of DevOps. So uh, a little bit about me, I live out in the sticks of New Hampshire. I've written two books. Um, they some time, time ago, I haven't written any books recently. It's a very tough endeavor to do. I live way up in the sticks of New Hampshire and have two young children and I should have had my wife in there. She'll be mad if I, that I didn't put her in there. I like to ski, and I like my tractor. <laughs> so, uh, we all know this. Enterprise workloads are mi migrating towards Docker. How many of you out there use Docker for what you're doing and what you're building and deploying out there? So, Docker is fantastic. It, it really allows you to build applications and make them shippable without worrying about dependency hell and all of the other annoyances you've experienced throughout your career, depending on how long you've been in it. I've, I've been doing this for decades now, and the, I remember the days when you'd have to install things manually and you'd have to pull your hair out with things not working. It's uh, those days of are long behind us now, though there are still a lot of challenges that you have to uh, deal with, and Docker is another step toward making that a lot easier. Um, you know, it's lightweight, it's intelligent packaging, intelligent deployment, and it's a rapidly evolving ecosystem. It's, it's very hard to pin down as to what's going on. There are some players that are obvious leaders in this, namely Kubernetes, CoreOS, Kelsey Hightower, who's here, he's He's uh, been somebody who's been extremely helpful in giving me tips and pointers and telling me ways of doing things. And uh, I'm, I'm really glad to have made his acquaintance and I was very happy to see that he was here at this conference. Um, one of the statements that, uh, who I work for, Brian Aker, he's a friend of mine, I've known him for decades. And uh, he, his statement is that Linux is the API and that really is true with containers. Docker does have some gaps and it's not so much that Docker is you know, doesn't fulfill a need. It's just that their Docker is very host specific. And for instance, you spin up a container. If you run a container in, in a daemon mode, then it takes an IP and that IP could be anything. That's fine. So what is it that it needs? It needs some kind of glue to make it so that you can do it multi-host and cluster it. And there are a number of projects that uh, do that. Um, Clustering Docker, what's important? Well, you want some coordination. You want, to, uh, you want some configuration and discovery for the base cluster and applications. You want to be able to deploy a Docker image to some node in the cluster. A scheduler, you want that to place the containers intelligently within the cluster. You know, taking into account how the actual hosts are running and whether there's any sort of conflict between containers that you're running. For instance, I might not want to run two MySQL servers containers on the same host. It can be done and it works fine, but maybe I want to make sure that things are evenly divided up and that's what the, you know, an intelligent scheduler will do that for you. Network. Interhost net networking is obscured 
in the default Docker model, there's a bridge that's set up, and like I said, it's, uh, you, you run a container, and if you run it backgrounded, then it obtains an IP address, and it could be anything. Somebody was asking me, well, how, somebody who was looking at doing Docker, they said, how could I run containers and be able to statically give it an IP address? And there are ways of doing it, but you have to roll your own. And that's why you want to look towards some of these projects that cluster Docker. Maintenance. Install and update the base system in a scalable and effective way. You want to be able to do that, obviously. Docker provides its own con images and containers. So here's some existing approaches to clustering Docker, and I, I probably have omitted some because, like I said, the, the ecosystem is rapidly evolving. CoreOS, Kubernetes, Swarm, Docker Machine, and so on and so forth. Uh, one of the ones we were looking at recently was Mesos, and that was another interesting way of, of uh, clustering containers and many other things. It's not just about containers with, with Mesos. CoreOS DNA. So it's a clustered Docker proof of concept. Why? Well, at HP, we have our own distribution of, of Debian called HLinux. And the reason for that is, is obviously HP has machines that have hardware-specific drivers. And we want a distribution that has that can be set up and run well on HP hardware, and that's what we have. And so our group, we, we really liked what we saw on CoreOS. We liked that functionality. We liked the components that comprise CoreOS. So we set out to see, well, can we run this on HLinux, on Debian? And of course, this, this holds true for Ubuntu. If it can run on a Debian, Ubuntu, and HLinux, then so on and so forth. So what we did is we, we built this. So, Here's a, a single node. This is true for CoreOS. It's true for our setup. You have Docker containers running in Docker. You have a, a container of whatever type of app you're running. Docker is running on that host. There's etcd. And then there's fleet that talks to systemd, running things on that host, and also using etcd for the information. And then you have your base in a system in your Linux kernel. kernel. You also have some clients, etcd, ctl, and fleet CTL. That's how you use to interact with, with CoreOS. And here's, here's a, uh, you know, when they're clustered together. You have, you have a CoreOS DNA cluster, and you have, again, your Docker images on each one. You have a Docker image repository. You have Docker running on each system. System D, of course, being part of uh, the version of Debian we were using, and true with CoreOS and the Docker containers running on there, and each one of those had etcd and, and fleet d running. And um, we, we did a lot of this. We had a, a control node, jump box. Now, and some people would run a jump box out in the cloud, HP Cloud. I would run my laptop to do that, because you can build all of these comp components on OS X, or whatever your preference of operating system is. And of course, these etcd, how many of you are familiar with etcd? Okay, you, a pretty good cross-section here. etcd, of course, you can run it and tell it exactly where your nodes are, or you can use the discovery server when it makes it much easier for doing dynamic clustering. Um, one of the things I was pulling my hair out with months and months ago, I, I was trying to get a cluster working, and Kelsey said, you know, when I run it, I just run a single etcd on, on my Mac or in a, a VM, and then have what I'm building, in, in, in this case, Kubernetes, talk to etcd that way. And that's another way of doing it. But in this case, we ran it on each node. Um, and here's networking as deployed, CoreOS DNA. You have your Docker bridge, the internal 172, whatever you decide to use. We also have the host private network on HP Cloud. That's 10 dot whatever. And then we have public NATed addresses, uh, floating IPs, and OpenStack, as they're called. And you, we would basically run this and have a Neutron router set up to, to do the routing for these. And of course, whatever services we exposed, we could access them over the public internet. And here's an example application. I found this really great example online from a fellow named Marcel de Graff. And he set up an Elk stack using CoreOS, using a number of containers pre-built. I, I did some slight modifications to it to work better with HP Cloud, but it's a really great example of showing how well CoreOS runs. And essentially, there was a container for Nginx, which was your front end, Elasticsearch and Kibana, you know, your, El your Elk um, kind of 
front end for talking, seeing what's going on with Logstash, and then a sample application to generate some traffic. And on each one of these containers that was running the sample application, it was running, putting logs in the, the uh, inside of a, lo a log, and there was an agent talking to Logstash and feeding Logstash this information so that something would show up and you'll see the, in the demonstration how this works. So, how did we build this? Um, I know that, uh, I, how many people use Ansible out here? Okay, more than I suspected. So, we, we use Ansible at HP Cloud now. We, we have used Chef before. All of these tools are wonderful and whatever you're proficient in, my philosophy is, is whatever tool gets the job done, use that tool. Whatever expertise you have in-house, that's what you should probably use. Don't try to reinvent the wheel. We, we use Ansible because we are you know, big OpenStack uh, proponents, and OpenStack is written in Python, and so there are a lot of Python programmers. So the, the, the virtue of that is that you, have, you can draw on your, the people who are doing the development also to do some DevOps type roles occasionally. So for Ansible, I used, we did it in several steps. The first step I would do is I would build, I would launch my instances on HP Cloud, and for that I used Nova Compute Ansible module. It basically lets me define in a YAML file which instances I want to run, how many of them I want to run. I also would use Nova Fax. Nova Fax is a module that I worked on, and essentially what it does is it allows, how many of you know what fax are? They're, it's essentially Ansible's way of collecting information when you connect to the target host that you're managing and collecting every little tidbit of information you want about it. You can also, you can cache it in um, Redis if you want to, to for speed improvements. And NovaFax does that for, for Nova, because Nova has a lot of metadata and information about what virtual machines you have running inside of Nova. We use Docker and Docker Fax to Docker to, to for running test containers to make sure that Docker is up and running. Docker Fax, I would use to obtain information about the running containers. It's a module that I wrote. I need to go back. It's got a, it's a serious case of bit rot, but it does essentially what I mentioned the Nova Fax does. Docker Fax uh, collects facts about your running containers and everything you'd want to know about them. Because if you, you know, if you do a, a Docker inspect on a container, there's tons of information about it. Docker Fax puts that into something you can utilize inside of your, your playbook. For instance, for what I like to do is I like to print out uh, sometimes of informational files, or even in the case of you have a, an organization that isn't using a clustering technology and they're doing something with IP tables where they go through and make sure their containers can um, go to the outside, you could build an IP table script that way. That's one way of doing it. You can also build inventory files. There are, in Ansible, there are dynamic inventory plugins which let you run against dynamically uh, whatever API you're talking to, whether it's Nova, AWS, or, or Docker itself. But I sometimes like to have hard written files and something like Docker Fax allows me to build an inventory file. Uh, Docker Pool also. Docker Pool was something we used to make sure um, in testing, I sometimes would have failures. I would run a unit file, and I'll explain what that is in a little bit, and the container would take a long time and there would be a timeout. So what I would do is I'd pre-pull my application images for doing, this, for doing the, uh, the sample app in advance so that when I ran them as units, they came up quickly. So using Ansible to provision etcd and build clusters. So I'd, I'd, the first step, we bring up the infrastructure, write an inventory file so we know what we're going to build this on. The second step is I would use Ansible to provision etcd and build the clusters. Um, query discovery URL, we have a playbook that would get the, a new URL to build the etcd cluster to, to tell it which discovery to use so that the, the etcd, um, each node connects and that it's clustered. Um, we'd write the URL to a local file at, and have it set as a variable, render etcd service file with a variable, and then when we launch etcd, it clus it, uh, the cluster comes up properly. We'd build and configure and run etcd. We'd build and configure and run fleet. And when I say build, we'd, we'd uh, bring the full go build environment on there and build uh, all the components we need because all of these core OS components are written in Go. How many of you are Go programmers out there? Okay. Probably a lot of Ruby people here and uh, Go is, uh, mo 
most of what I see in the Docker ec ecosystem is written in Go, and Kelsey can verify that for me. Um, what's that? <laughs> I myself would like to get more acquainted with Go. It looks like a really exciting language. I just have been so busy trying to build these things that I haven't had time. Anyway, so uh, next step, etcd. So the special sauce. Now, this is kind of a neat thing. This is features of Chorus. You know, we're talking about Ansible a little bit, and then I'm talking a little bit about how I build these containers to make everything function nicely. Etcd is integral to the cluster functioning. It's what provides information for discovery so that Fleet knows what's running and can run, interact with systemd on uh, each of the hosts and run whatever is necessary. Um, Fleet communicates with etcd to obtain key values from etcd. Etcd also uses, used by, it, I also use the, the running etcd by a sample LCAP to store key value pairs used by ConfD. ConfD is this wonderful tool that Kelsey wrote that it essentially lets you define a configuration file for a template and then the template itself and it tells, it basically tells ConfD how to write that template. For instance, if, you're, if you uh, have a number of web applications running and you want to make sure that um, Nginx proxies correctly to it, or uh, HA proxy, or whatever you want, you can have it render these files, and it'll render it based off of a key that it pulls out of etcd and uses that discovery information to properly render the, the template. And you can also tell it to do nifty things like only do that once, don't do it every time. Or you tell it, please watch what's going on in etcd, and if there are changes, update the configuration file so that when the service you know, the service will update itself and it'll proxy correctly. Uh, ConfD. So each of my containers, I, I put ConfD on there. And of course, as I mentioned, it keeps an eye on the files rendered and makes sure that if any changes occur inside of etcd that it updates them. And it uses those key values it gets from etcd to interpolate in the template what, what, it, uh, what should be rendered. It also automatically keeps the files up to date with etcd information. That's, I, I said that already. So uh, the, the other thing, the other special sauce, systemd unit files. So systemd unit files are essentially, how many of you uh, are familiar with systemd now? Systemd is the, going to be the replacement for the unit system. And there are a lot of nice features that I think that systemd has. Um, the, the unit files in this case that we're running pertain to containers. If you look at a stock systemd setup, it, you're just running processes, but with, with CoreOS and Fleet, you're actually running a container just like you would any other process. So you have exec start pre, and in this case, we would pull the image. Um, exec start, which would run the image, run the container, exec start post, that would run some steps after the image is up and running. For instance, I bring up my log stash container and I want etcd to know where it is so that other things can discover it. So what I would do is in the unit file, I specify please set your IP address in etcd. Except stop post, of course, when I disappear, when I go away, when I die, I want etcd to know that I'm gone, so I remove my entry from etcd. Um, Elasticsearch. Um, Elasticsearch unit file, it's a, the, the, one of the things it does is sets its own public and private IPs in etcd for discovery by logstash because some things we want to know are external IP address that we have uh, that's uh, public facing and then maybe we also want to communicate it with, with it privately. Logstash, it sets its own IP address for discovery in logstash by logstash agents. Um, so that the logstash agents running on the app or whatever you have running know where logstash is. The Sinatra app, um, one of the things I did, it was slightly hackish, but I set the title of the app in etcd as well as the IP address for uh, discovery by Nginx to generate, so that Nginx can generate its configuration file using ConfD. Dockerfile functionality, some, some tricks in the Dockerfile. Elasticsearch, I install ConfD. I just take the binary and put it on there. I install and configure Elasticsearch. Install COPF, it's a plugin for, for um, Elasticsearch. And Kibana, 
plugins, expose port 9200 for e and, and then launch it. Logstash, I install ConfD, install and configure long, uh, Logstash, and then I run a boot script. The boot script is what it's, uh, you can, what I usually use is entry point. Entry point inside of a Docker file says run this when you run the container. Some people want to run containers like, they sort of run them like pets, like VMs, so they run something like SSHD. So you can put that in your, your, your entry point. But that, you know, that's just one example. You, it, you can put anything in your entry point, whatever you want to run on there. Sinatra, I would install Sinatra. I'm sure there are a lot of people who knows what Sinatra here is, because we have a Ruby crowd, right? Hands? Okay, Sinatra is uh, a, a Ruby app, and I used it just as, because that's what Marcel de Graff used in his example, and I found it to be quite suitable for this. Um, I place the Logstash agent on there, and I expose port 5000, which is what the application is going to be running on, and then run boot.shell. Nginx, I install Nginx, ConfD, and then I run boot.shell. So then there's one more thing, the entry point script, the boot shell that I just mentioned. Um, for Logstash, I use it to render the Logstash config. I run ConfD dash one time, that means it runs only once and never does it again. I generate the SSL private insert, key insert, that it stores that in etcd, and then I run logstash, because I need that, S, that private key in there, because um, Sinatra needs that. Um, render the app, SSL certain keys, um, I set up the logstash forwarding agent, I start logstash forwarder, and then I start the Sinatra app. Nginx, I render the nginx.conf again one time, and start confd to check and update the configuration file every 10 minutes, I start Nginx and then I tail the logs so that I can see what's going on. And here is a uh, resource file for ConfD so you can kind of get an idea of what ConfD looks like. Um, keys up here pertains to the keys you're pulling from etcd. And inside the template you'll see, I'll, sh I'll show you what, how, how you interpolate them in the template. But in this case we want to know the, the keys, the app, we want to know what the server is, the, and that's the IP address of the server, and the Elasticsearch host. So the IP address for the application and the, the IP address for Elasticsearch. Um, the owner is Nginx, so you know, all, all of the rest of the things here are static content. Um, and then inside the template, um, this is much like any other templating language. Um, I'm, I'm familiar with Jinja quite a bit, but I've also used IRB for, and when, I, when I did chef work. Um, so right here you'll see dot app underscore server. That, pertain, that uh, correlates to app slash server that you pulled out of etcd. Um, and the same thing pertains to Elasticsearch underscore host. Same thing, Elasticsearch slash host. And is, if you look at etcd, you can see all of these entries in there. Um, for instance, you saw up there, um, I showed you app server, and port 5000, that's, that's the IP address. So it knows how to, re it, it uses f information from etcd to build that template and render that, that config file. And you can put other things in etcd. Now, um, this is a side note, but in Kubernetes, they don't do this so much where they put information inside of the, the etcd that's being used by Kubernetes. They, often run, you can run your own etcd container, but that's another issue I, you know, you can ask me questions about that. Um, but uh, for this, for this um, demonstration that I'm doing here and what we built, we, we chose to do it this way. Oh, sorry about that. So here is basically what we end up building. We have etcd, which provides kind of the glue for everything fleet on each host, systemd on each host, and then you can see the distribution of how the containers would, in one example, run. You'd have, we'd make sure that all the Sinatra apps were spread out across, that there was, that there was a good spread of those. Um, and then there's Elasticsearch running by itself on one, and then on the other you have Logstash and Nginx. It could be anything. It, it just depends how it distributes it. You can also tell, um, in CoreOS, you can tell when you launch a unit file not to place the same units on the same host. That's another thing you can do. Um, here's, here's how the application, the, the graphics were kind of goofed up here. PowerPoint, I love PowerPoint. Microphone. 
So um, <laughs> this is with everything distributed and running. So uh, you have three workers. I, they're, you, they're the application hosts. And we're using Docker to take 5,001 uh, to uh, forward to, to uh, proxy to 5,000 on each one of those. Um, and then there's a log stash service, the Elasticsearch service, the, uh, the application, and Nginx. And um, each of those is pulling from etcd. I've showed some entries on there to kind of give you an idea. And then the public in intranet is talking to uh, Nginx and the public facing Elasticsearch to talk to all of these. So here's the demo. I, I show YouTube here, but I'm not going to attempt to play this off of YouTube. I have a uh, recorded demo here. I hope I'm not going too fast and I'm going a good speed. Please let me know if um, I'm going too fast for you guys. But uh, I'm going to play this demo and I'll explain if some of what it's doing, but you can also ask me questions while this is running. I didn't mean to minimize it. going to have to. Okay, it's running. So the first thing we're doing is we're gathering facts from Nova, and we're going to launch the instances. We've launched five of them because we're building a five-node cluster. The next thing, we want to verify that the instances were launched on OpenStack. And indeed they were, and we want to make note of our IP addresses and which host names we've used. The next step is we're actually going to, build, we're going to generate an inventory file. And the reason I do a pseudo password here is I not only in, uh, generate an inventory file, but I, I'm lazy, like the last fellow said. I want to write this in my host, too. I want, I want to be able to SSH by name the hosts that have been launched. And that's what I do here. And that's a local action. So now we're going to build, this is the inventory file that we're going to build the cluster with. And he, these are the servers we're going to build it on. I'm just kind of confirming that everything's sane looking. I'm going to confirm that I can ping, do manually ping each one of them. And then I'm going to do an Ansible ping of each one of these to make sure that Ansible can talk over SSH to each of them and that there aren't any surprises. And everything's good to go. So now I know I can build this cluster. So starting the cluster build. Again, we gather facts. We're updating the package information. Copy over the sample app. I'm going to put git on each of these because I'm going to build all of the components from source, etcd, fleet, and the clients as well. So here we go. We're going to put go on there and make sure it's the latest version. I'm going to put some file system tools on there. We were experimenting with ButterFS. Um, I ended up using just stock um, ext4. I also mount the uh, drive that we're going to put Docker on. We're installing Docker. And it didn't go this fast. I, the, through the magic of video editing, it, it, this, this play has gone much faster than, than in the real world. I wouldn't want to bore the heck out of you guys. So we're pulling the sample app images. That's the part that goes really fast in this demo. So now we're installing and configure at CD. Here's the part where we build by source. Feel free to ask any questions. Some of this is kind of, you know, watching something run. Yes? Yes, because, you know, you could, your, some of the containers could stop running and you'd want that to be reflected inside the configuration file from what changes in etcd. So now we're building fleet. Did I answer your question? Two minutes? Okay. <laughs> I think, let's see. I'm going to get to the good stuff here. <laughs> 
So everything's built at this point. So what we're going to do is we're going to set our fleet endpoint. I picked what the last node in there, DOD-05. That's how I'm going to interact with fleet. So now I can write fleet con run fleet control list machines. Now I'm going to load each of my unit files. The first one I'm going to launch is going to be, um, the first thing you do is you submit your, your unit files, and then you, you run the unit. So we start off the Elasticsearch service. I thought it was Logstash, but um, and the next one after that that we'll run is we're going to run Logstash. I'm going to skip through that. So Logstash. So now you see Logstash and Elasticsearch running. We're going to run each of the, uh, um, we're going to submit all the Sinatra services. Now we're going to each start each one of the Sinatras. And here, here we see the first one running, and then you see subsequent ones running. So we've run all four of the Sinatra services. So at this point, we want to see what IP addresses we have to, to work with um, and what we expect to see Nginx proxying to. So the last one we, we run is the Nginx service. So now we're going to make a note of that IP address for Nginx, because that's how we're going to uh, access the, the web interface. 101. Make sure all our Sinatra's services are running. And we're going to access this. I already have it in there in the URL. So the application is just a simple at test application with two links in it, one to the back end for um, Kibana and Kopf. Kopf I don't really do much with, but it was Marcel had it in his demonstration. So at this point, we have a nice dashboard. And because I accessed this page a few times, there's a few accesses on here, but that's not that exciting. So what I want to do next is I want to, I have a benchmark script that a, a Ruby benchmark script for talking to this application. So I start running that. So now we should see some web accesses inside of Elasticsearch. I'm going to highlight the time so we can see more specifically what's going on. Starting to see some traffic. Now we should really see some traffic because that application is going. And now we've seen that this uh, sample app runs and shows us that the proof of concept works. So that's, that should be the end of the video right there. I'll see if there are any more slides. <laughs> So questions, comments, or feedback? I have my URLs for each of these repositories for building this out there. Thank you, Pat. Okay.